Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm a little bit late to the show. Um, first of all, I have to uh, disclose something about me. As of last month, I'm a full-time employee of Eli Lilly um, and uh, Corporation um, and uh, hold shares in Lilly. Um, Lilly is not involved in anything of this, what is going on here. This happened all way before in my previous life. <clears throat> so um that's to me that's uh towards me uh, that being said it's my great pleasure to introduce my now former colleague peter chang from uc irvine who is co-founder and co-director of the center for artificial intelligence and diagnostic medicine he is a diagnostic neuroradiologist um, an expert in um, machine learning especially deep learning and has run quite some uh, federated learning projects i'm very Happy to introduce him here and now hand over to him to give his talk. Thanks a lot, Alex, for that invitation. Uh, pleasure to be here. Really cool and interesting stuff here. Uh, really got a pleasure uh, to, to be with like-minded folks. All right, I'm going to dive right into this. I know uh, we have very short uh, talks here. So um, uh, before I start, I will point out, as, as Alex mentioned, as part of our, our lab and our center, um, We've certainly interacted and, and engaged with federated learning from different perspectives, including many of the high-level platforms uh, that we've heard about today. I believe someone is actually going to talk about the NVIDIA Flare platform specifically following myself. So I will I'll, all I'll say here is that we've used these uh, uh, platforms in the past. They're great. Uh, I'm not going to focus on it here, but I'm only doing that because there are other speakers uh, that will uh, have dedicated time. Um, Instead, I'm going to focus on an alternative, which is, um, again, not necessarily better or worse. I'm going to go over the pros and cons, um, but it's essentially trying to, to write the custom code yourself uh, inside a native package like TensorFlow or PyTorch. And specifically, what I'm going to focus on is a, uh, I guess, a, a, a relative of federated learning, which uh, is more uh, precisely termed distributed learning and, and kind of see how that might fit into some of the experiments uh, your team is planning. Uh, this will also inevitably, uh, if, if you're not using a platform, involve some sort of DevOps um, uh, tooling on, on your own end, things like Kubernetes and, and Docker's containerization, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, I want to emphasize again that uh, compared to federated learning, which is, again, something we're all quite familiar with at this point, uh, where training is asynchronous, uh, performed in parallel at multiple sites and simply aggregated at a central server after each epoch, for example. Um, what I'm proposing here is slightly different. It's, it's truly distributed machine learning where training is synchronous. Uh, I'm, I'm actually proposing to aggregate weights after each training iteration. So, so very rapid and, and fast updates. Um, doing this obviates the need for a central model server and ends up simplifying a lot of the uh, overhead that one would expect in a uh, federated or multi-site learning uh, operation. Um, to emphasize here, uh, the key advantages, why you might consider this approach, is that uh, the support for distributed deep learning is now quite good in all the native uh, deep learning packages. Uh, our team primarily uses TensorFlow and Keras, but PyTorch has the exact same uh, support. This means that if you're writing your code in one of these packages already, it, you're really looking at a very small amount of code modifications to, to get up and running in a distributed setting. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's limited overhead because we don't need any central server uh, to coordinate uh, joining uh, of different sites, uh, waiting for epochs to finish at one site or another. Um, the aggregation strategy that you choose um, to merge weights uh, is itself a hyperparameter that you typically have to sweep over. Um, so anyways, you're simplifying uh, the experiment quite a bit. And, and overall, the convergence is more stable because you're actually um, training uh, synchronously on all the data, uh, the, the uh, potential instabilities you see with divergent data sets across sites. Uh, becomes less of an issue. The primary disadvantage, as many of you guys probably recognize as I'm talking about this, is that uh, your nodes across different sites need to have a relatively low latency between one another. Um, for most uh, academic institutions, this is actually not too much of an issue. Um, we've, we've also run experiments where each site has their own uh, instance in the cloud in Amazon or Azure, for example, um, which uh, is a very relatively low latency network. And before um, 
uh, you, you completely write this off, I will point out um, the use of a distributed uh, network like this, uh, even if each iteration itself is slow, you're actually able to speed up training uh, linearly to the number of participating sites because of a interesting effect here where your uh, learning rate can actually grow uh, with the size of your uh, a mini batch as you get more and more sites. This is actually um, the source of the, the popular Facebook uh, paper a few years ago where um, they were able to train ImageNet in just one hour because they simply took many, many nodes, linked them all together. And even though there was overhead for each node to communicate each, with each other at each step, um, the large batch, uh, the large learning rate allowed for training to, to actually compensate for that uh, bottleneck. Now, uh, again, I'm not positive where all the sites here are from, but uh, Within the University of California system, there, there are some very high speed networks that are available for research, things like the Pacific Research Platform, which is actually where we've done most of our experiments, um, where actually every UC site and, and actually over 50 sites across the country are linked on a 50 gig network um, to, to do these types of experiments. So if that's uh, uh, something that you can take advantage of, I would certainly propose that. Um, here is an example snippet of the type of modification that you would need to just highlight how um, straightforward it is. Uh, after you import your libraries, there's really just one step where you set up uh, um, essentially an environment variable here uh, in TensorFlow. Uh, this environment variable simply needs to have the IP address and available ports of all the nodes that you're looking to join in the experiment. And then simply another entry in your JSON uh, that indicates which node you are currently, right? And as long as each site sets one of these environment variables up correctly, uh, as soon as you call the distribute uh, multi-worker strategy in TensorFlow, that information is aggregated. Um, this will actually uh, block at this line of code until all the sites are available. And then uh, you simply uh, you know, add a, a simple uh, a statement like this before you define all your model and, and everything else distal of this. this. This remains completely unchanged. You can just copy paste and use all of your standard code and, and TensorFlow again will take care of all the distribution for you uh, under the hood fairly easily. So again, uh, to be clear, we're talking about probably three or four lines of code um, to, to modify any existing training uh, protocol that you have. Um, the other piece that you you will want to think about again, if you're you're going to do this yourself without using a high level platform, is you, you probably want a, a a good way to manage the code you're using to train uh, at all the different sites. Uh, for for the most part, that will probably mean you need to containerize your code in some way. Uh, we use Docker quite a bit, but certainly you can use your container of choice. Um, this. Uh, for those that are uh, not aware, simply allows you to package up your code and all your de dependencies very efficiently so that all your sites uh, have access to the exact same um, uh, uh, sort of dependencies. Uh, there's no limitations on the underlying operating systems you're running, for example. Um, and then another layer I would add on top of that is some sort of orchestration platform. So we typically use Kubernetes. Um, all participating sites will join the same Kubernetes network. And what that simply means is that um, at any one site, I can start and, and coordinate the jobs. I don't need to call up all my friends at the other sites and have everybody waiting at the computers to press play and, and run an experiment or, or to continuously press play as you debug uh, uh, errors. Um, this can be coordinated all at one point as, as long as that Kubernetes network is set up. And again, assuming you're using containers uh, to, to execute your code makes things just a lot easier. Um, with the last few minutes, I just want to highlight another um, uh, sort of novel angle that we're trying to pursue with a lot of our work. Um, uh, I know labeling data at different sites is a fairly uh, significant bottleneck and, and difficult to harmonize and ensure consistency. Uh, and, and so one of our uh, primary research interests is actually the use of mixed labels. So strong, high, highly accurate, uh, maybe voxel level master labels at one or a few sites, but allowing many other additional sites to join in on the training process with minimal or no label. All right, minimal or no label. So multi, uh, uh, multi-label, multi-task type networks. Um, uh, using semi-supervised or unsupervised learning at the majority of, of other sites. Again, that completely obviates the need to worry about um, how you're going to carry your data. Um, the particular uh, pretext task that uh, our group was interested in is essentially um, 
creating a, a problem where by the model must label each specific portion in the body, in this case, the brain, with a unique identifier, with a unique coordinate system, such that the pituitary or the thalamus or the fourth ventricle here um, are all labeled uniquely and are all labeled exactly the same way for every single patient. All right. Um, this type of anatomic consistency from patient to patient, forcing the algorithm to do this task over and over again, uh, is a is again a, actually a very strong regulator. It helps uh, uh, helps the model learn quite a bit from the data uh, without any labels. And and for those of you that are familiar, it's, it's, you can think about it as a form of contrastive learning. We're taking similar parts of each image, each volume, and mapping those similar parts to each other. Um, those of you out there. Um, that are following along may point out this is very similar to a co-registration task, and you'd be uh, absolutely right. In a standard co-registration deep learning task, I would feed my model two images. I would get some feature vector here at the end of my model, and that feature vector would be correlated to some displacement field. They'll tell me how much I need to move to align one particular location of a volume to another. Though this is similar, it's a little bit different than what I would like to do, because ultimately I want to pretest tasks that can be used for something interesting downstream, like in anatomy segmentation, landmark detection, maybe identifying some sort of pathology. And so the fact that my feature vector here is going to vary based on these two images, I could arbitrarily move one of the images and the displacement field completely changes. That's not as useful for what I would like to ideally do, which is again, reuse these feature vectors for something interesting downstream. So instead, what we're proposing is that the algorithm uh, removes one of these moving images, so essentially replaces it with a learned template, a template that the algorithm is able to discover on its own through looking at data. And in that, in that case, rather than predicting the displacement, our model is predicting the absolute location from within a set template space. So each patient, uh, uh, you know, for a particular location for the pituitary camp must be predicted here with that exact same precise location inside my, my template in absolute space. To see what this looks like, here's an example. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of sagittal 2D images uh, of the brain for comparison. So using these as our input, I'm gonna scroll quickly here. So this is the learned template uh, that our model discovers through the, through the unsupervised pre-training process. And this is my model's attempt to identify each corresponding location in each of these raw input images to its correct location inside the template space. Um, and again, those that are privy with registration would also be able to uh, recognize that I could take that one-to-one -one mapping and essentially morph my template to match that input space like this. That's what you're seeing here. And you, and you see, again, relatively high concordance. Um, what this also means, um, so to, to visualize what I was just showing you a second ago, um, after the model has successfully pre-trained on uh, the cohort, I can arbitrarily label uh, any points that I would like anywhere in an image. And those uh, can be easily propagated to an entire data set. So it's basically labeling, again, all these locations in exactly the same way for, for every single patient. Um, just a couple uh, maybe quick videos. This is the same thing here uh, in, in 3D so that you can uh, appreciate sort of the same uh, co-registration and alignment process that's occurring. Um, what you can do with something like this uh, is that you can go into your template space and for example, arbitrarily choose a bounding uh, cube of what you would like to study. This is valuable because in a federated learning experiment, for example, you might need a way to ensure that all the data has a very similar field of view or is normalized and regularized in some way. This method helps to do that. You just draw a bounding box and we can ensure that all the data is exactly uh, the, the same and uniform. And finally, again, the, the process can be run iteratively. So even on a very fine scale, I can go through and I can ask the algorithm to either identify landmarks uh, or to segment out relevant areas of interest without too much uh, additional work here. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and move past, uh, I'll, so, so I think it's fairly clear 
um, I, I think with those examples, what's going on underneath the hood here, um, segmentation, as you might expect, is nothing more than identification of many landmarks all in a row. So the exact same thing uh, can be used for anatomic segmentation. Um, so how do we use this in a training experiment? So again, here's uh, two options. Uh, what you just saw a second ago was purely unsupervised uh, pre-training with a single shot label. Um, and to some extent, that, that can be useful uh, for uh, patients with pathology or other distracting injuries. Uh, it's, it's probably ideal to have some small subcohort labeled. And so, so that's the key again. The, the labels will come from one or a handful of sites uh, which have the, the ability and overhead and coordination to uh, ensure good, consistent labels, um, uh, to, to ensure uh, objectivity and stability between multiple readers and things like that. Whereas the majority of the remainder of sites um, can actually just contribute data on its own without, uh, without any uh, special labeling. And, and this is the last slide I have here. Um, I know we're, we're certainly interested in a task where uh, we're identifying abnormalities instead of localizing or, or identifying normal structures. Um, the same exact uh, paradigm can be used for abnormality detection. Uh, in this case, you might imagine that the algorithm is able to identify uh, the normal distribution of each point, each location in a particular anatomic region. And by simply looking to see how much a particular region deviates from the normal pop population, uh, you can you can get estimates of which things in the image are generically abnormal, including uh, multiple sclerosis demyelinating lesions. All right. Uh, anyways, uh, I think we're just about out of time. We have a few minutes for questions, I believe we have them. But uh, anyways, uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed that. And <laughs> thanks for your uh, attention. Yes. Thank you so much, Peter, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, we have uh, two questions that I see currently in the chat. One, the first one is uh, from Julian. How does the Deep Atlas approach compare to the traditional pre-processing strategy, skull scripting, affine, and nonlinear registration to MNI template? Yeah, so uh, the, the examples I happen to pick here are from a neuro <laughs> CT project. And so for those of us in the neuroimaging world, there, there are good existing tools uh, for for uh, pre-processing. And I would say uh, for the vast majority of kind of normal looking brains, especially MRI exams, uh, you're, there's no significant advantage. The current tools are already very good. Uh, I would say the primary advantage is for um, things like CT, where you don't have good co-registration oftentimes between uh, different body parts. And as you move outside of the brain, um, you know, again, the co-registration, the degree of motion and, and deformations are, are fairly hard to adjust for. Um, finally, I will point out that uh, though the algorithm can certainly be used as pre-processing, I would emphasize that um, the real value is to use this pre-training task as an unsupervised objective. So again, in a, in a federated learning uh, environment, uh, the ability to allow others to join easily without having to worry about everyone labeling data the same way, uh, uh, or perhaps people don't even have the the uh, you know overhead the, the ability to label data. Um, I, I think that's really where the the primary novelty is here. Thank you very much. And the second question is by uh, Ashley Pike. Which template space does Deep Atlas use? Yeah, that's a that's always the question I get when I show. So so this is to be clear um, a completely learned template space. The algorithm is able to learn its own template space. Uh, based on whatever input data you have. You might imagine that most template spaces uh, right, are, are generated from a very specific cohort with certain assumptions, uh, typically in very specific narrow demographics. Um, this algorithm is able to, to do this completely on its own. So it starts with a completely random atlas, random variable, random numbers. And through the training process, the, the atlas space is discovered on its own. Um, at the same time, you can, you can think about this um, as uh, the ability to extend atlases in very specific directions. So if you were very interested in certain substructures uh, or areas of uh, uh, the body where no good templates exist, um, this, this approach would, would certainly help you out. 